Hello, and welcome back to Building Integrity. I'm your host, Josh Porter. And in my last video, we started talking about Florida and the homeowner insurance uh, system that we have going on here and really throughout the whole nation and how it's a scam. And I received some criticism in the comment sections about not really providing proof or evidence and so on. Um, but my goal all along was to always create a two-part video series. I just didn't expect to be such a long gap between the two videos. Um, but in this video, we're gonna get down into the evidence, into the nitty gritty. I'm gonna show you um, the, let's just call it for legal purposes, the appearance of corruption in the government. I am going to show you the laws that actually support uh, insurance companies performing fraud in Florida. And I'm going to show you videos of actual whistleblowers coming forward and exposing the actual fraud that insurance companies are doing. So you guys are not gonna wanna miss this video because it is chocked full of really great information. Okay, in 2022, we had three insurance regulators and another high-ranking official in the Florida government all resign in the same year, in the year 2022, and all for very similar reasons. And we're gonna go through these right now, and, and, and I'm going to uh, point out some interesting things about them. But one of the things I want you guys to understand is that in the state of Florida, and this is true in a lot of states in, in, in the country, the in order to get a job working for the state government in insurance regulation, now remember, your job is to regulate insurance companies. Your, your goal is to, to make sure that they're financially sound, that they're not selling policies that they can't support, and that they're not committing fraud. So your job is to regulate the insurance industry. Now in the state of Florida, you cannot get a job working for the state as an insurance regulator unless you have previously worked for the insurance industry. I kid you not. Or you have to previously have worked in regulation, insurance regulation. But again, if you think about it, in order to first get in, you have to have uh, worked for the insurance companies. And then what happens is that these insurance regulators leave and then go work for the insurance companies that they just went and cut deals with and worked with for the last several years as regulators. And so it begs the question, how much regulation do they actually do? So let's break this down and start looking into them. The first person uh, that retired in 2022 of the four that we're going to talk about is Dane Eagle. Now, Dane Eagle is the, or was, I should say, the secretary of the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Okay. As soon as Dane resigned in 2022, he took a job at Ballard Law Firm, which is a lobbying and PR firm. Uh, the second person that resigned in 2022 is John Riley. He works for the office, or worked, again, <laughs> for the Office of Insurance Regulation as the Deputy Commissioner of Life and Health Insurance Regulation. Now, John Riley took a job, uh, as soon as he resigned, he took a job at Oscar Health, which is a health insurance company. Again, one of the companies that he was just, prior to resigning, in charge of regulating. Uh, Oscar Health, if you don't know anything about them, they sell health insurance here in Florida and throughout the nation. Uh, they are funded by venture capitalist and billionaire Josh Kushner, which is the brother of Jared Kushner. Now, Oscar Health lost nearly 90% of its stock value since going public in 2021 and started pulling out of multiple markets all over the place. However, in 2022, they actually ended up doubling their revenue from the previous year. So what you have to understand is that because this business started in 2012, in 2022, they actually ended up doing more business than they did in the entire prior decade of their existence. Um, and, and that's kind of a big deal. It's this, this means this is a very healthy, very strong uh, insurance company. So despite losing a lot of its stock value uh, since going public in 21, um, the actual company revenues and the quarterlies that they put out are very healthy. And so as soon as uh, John Riley resigned as the deputy commissioner of life and health insurance regulation, they took him up and employed him. Suzanne uh, Murphy uh, was also working for the Office of Insurance Regulation. She was the Deputy Commissioner of Property and Casualty Insurance Regulation. And she resigned and then took a job at Meenan PA, which is a law firm that lobbies state governments for changes in insurance related to laws that favor insurance companies. So you start seeing a trend here, right? These are people that are supposed to be regulating insurance companies. They do work for the government, let's just say. And then after uh, uh, doing some dubious uh, type of work for the government and regulating these industries, they immediately go and take a job for these industries. Now, 
they make a lot more money as a lobbyist and a PR person than they do working for the government. So the government is really just a stepping stone to call favors and then go work as a lobbyist afterwards. And this brings us to the fourth person, which is kind of the most important for this video series. And this is David Altmaier. He also worked for the Office of Insurance Regulation. He was actually the uh, Florida Office of Insurance Regulation Commissioner. And David Altmaier, uh, we don't know where he is working yet, but David Altmaier was a um, big proponent of pushing through this new Senate bill, Senate Bill 2A, which got passed in December of 2022. And this is going to be the, a little bit of the heart of what we're talking about in this video. So he re really was advocating for this as a regulator. He's saying this is really good. This is good for uh, 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 Florida citizens and it's good for the public. And even the major news networks and stuff picked this up and said, oh, this new law is getting passed and this is going to help the consumer. This is going to help the consumer. Well, as we start breaking down this law and I start analyzing it with you, you're going to realize that it's the exact opposite. This law is for the insurance companies. Okay. Now, the law, Senate Bill 2A, gets passed and it gets signed into law by Governor Ron DeSantis on December 28th. I'm sorry, on December 16th, 2022, that very same day, David Altmaier puts in his letter of resignation in his two week notice so that he can be out by December 28th, 2022. So why did all four of these government officials and, and, and insurance regulators want to be out in 2022 before the first of the year? I mean, David Altmaier literally resigned. This is the big bill of his, of his career that he got pushed through and he resigns the day that it gets signed in. Why not stay on and see it be regulated? Why not stay on and see it success, the, the, the fruits of your success, right? Why quit right after the thing gets passed? Well, interestingly enough, earlier in 2022, Florida had passed a law which states that anybody working in these types of offices doing regulation, once they resign, they have to wait six years to become a lobbyist or to work for law or to work for the industry that they were just regulating. So all of these people don't want to wait six years to start cashing in on the big money, the good money. They want to start cashing in their favors now. And so therefore they all put in their resignation all to be effective before January 1st, 2023. Now, of course, all of what I just talked about is only the appearance of government corruption. Um, you layer the cake enough and it kind of looks like a cake, right? But I'm not saying that I have proof that these people committed any, any sort of wrongdoing or any sort of crimes. It's just the appearance of corruption. Um, you have a, a state which requires that you work for the insurance industry to become a regulator. And then you have people that are regulators that as soon as they're done being regulators, go and work for the insurance industry. I'm just saying the whole system breeds and, and, and promotes corruption. I'm not saying that any of these individuals are actually corrupt in their activities. Now, this raises the question though. So why, uh, David Altmaier, why, did, why push Senate Bill 2A? Well, the thing that we've been sold here in Florida is that this is a good bill and a good law for the consumer. We need protections for the consumer because insurance companies are leaving the state of Florida and they're going bankrupt and so on and so forth. However, if you actually analyze which companies are going bankrupt, it's none of the big ones. Okay, State Farm's not going bankrupt, Allstate's not going bankrupt, bankrupt. The big insurers are not going bankrupt in Florida. They're doing just fine. Okay, they complain and they complain about uh, contractors committing fraud against them, but they're doing financially just fine. The, the companies that go out of business are the companies that are small, you've never heard of. Some of these businesses, you almost just get the feeling when you start digging into the books that these companies were created simply to sell policies for four, five, six years, cash in on that, and then just go bankrupt so that they don't have to pay out on any of those policies. So it looks like a bit of a, a Florida shell game, which unfortunately shell companies are, are, are not regulated well in Florida at all. So before we get into Senate Bill 2A though, and just the complete obnoxiousness of this bill uh, for the consumer, I wanna talk about some bills that, are, that were already on the books in Florida that already sort of support insurance industries. The first one is uh, the fact that insurance companies are legally allowed, according to Florida statutes, to false advertise in Florida. Okay, um, under Florida statute 817, there are several definitions and I'm gonna go through them real quick and I'm gonna show them on the screen and, we're gonna talk, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. 
817.4 uh, talks about false, misleading, and deceptive advertising uh, and sales definitions. Okay, and so what they're saying is that you know these are things you're not you're not allowed to do. Uh, misleading advertising is prohibited. That's 0 .41, 0 .44. Intentional false advertising is prohibited. Okay, and then it goes on. 0.45 covers various penalties. However, you get down to 0.47, and there's an insurance advertising exemption. And so it's saying that nothing in these previous statutes that I just mentioned, uh, misleading advertising, intentional false advertising, false misleading or deceptive uh, uh, sales, none of those shall be deemed to apply to advertising in connection with sales of insurance, which are regulated under the in insurance laws of this state. And so if you think that the insurance regulation laws has strict penalties against false advertising, you would be wrong. There's not really any language in there that covers that. So essentially what you have here in the Florida books for a long time has been that insurance companies are allowed to tell you almost whatever they want to, that they're going to protect you, um, that uh, you know we're there, we're there for you when trouble hits. And they can say anything they want on television. You guys have seen the ads, the State Farm ads, the Allstate ads, okay? The progressive ads, they're all gonna protect you, they're all in your corner, they're all there to support you. And then they can do whatever they want after the fact and they can never get penalized for false advertising in Florida. The other thing that happened prior to this bill was Senate Bill 4D, which got passed in May of 2022. Now, Senate Bill 4D has to do with building inspections, um, required building inspections for condominiums as, as a um, in response to the collapse of the Champlain Towers South, right? But they snuck in another little bill in there uh, where it modifies the Florida Building Code. And it says, um, and I'll just read the highlighted section, if 25% or more of such a roofing system or roof section is being repaired, replaced, or recovered, only the repaired, replaced, or recovered portion is required to be constructed in accordance with the Florida Building Code. The reason why this is important is because the way it used to be written was that if 25% or more of the roof is damaged or is going to be repaired, you have to replace the whole thing. The intent with the code was to make sure that all roofs were always being brought up to code and not just being patchworked year after year, decade after decade. The, 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 the goal behind the building code was to make sure buildings are safe and good. Well, now we're just allowed to repair ad nauseum. The reason why this is important, the reason why this is in an insurance video is because most insurance policies have something called codes and ordinances coverage. And so what that means is that your insurer is required to pay for anything that the code requires. So maybe only 30% of your roof is actually damaged, but because the code used to require total replacement, the insurance company had to pay for total replacement, but not anymore, not since the code's been rewritten. So Senate Bill 2A takes this existing disparity, which already heavily favors the insurance companies and just dials this thing up to an 11. Let's start looking at the new Florida statutes that Florida Senate Bill 2A created in December of 2022. Florida Statute 624.1551, Civil Remedy Against Actions Against Property Insurers. The difference between an insurer's appraiser's final estimate and the appraisal award may be evidence of bad faith but is not deemed an adverse adjudication under this section and 447 does not on its own give rise to a cause of action. Now this is really sort of fancy attorney speak. What it is saying is that, and this, is, this isn't like a, a commentary, this is the actual law, the actual Florida statute. What it's saying is that if your insurance adjuster comes out and he or she tells you that you have $100,000 of damages to your building and the insurance company offers you $10,000 to make your building whole, the law literally says this may be evidence of bad faith. Okay, so they're admitting, yeah, the insurance company might be committing fraud here, but it is not deemed an adverse adjudication under this section and that's and, and the, the important part is it's, it's, it goes on to say on its own does not give rise to a cause of action. What this means is that if your insurance adjuster comes out and identifies that you have $100,000 of damages and your insurance company only offers you $10,000, you cannot sue the insurance company. That's what cause of action means. In order to sue some uh, another uh, private party, you have to have a cause of action. Not only does that does this language 
absolve these insurance companies from being sued for literally committing fraud, but you actually, you know, fraud is a criminal charge as well. So this absolves them of any criminal charges for committing widespread fraud. And as we go in through this video, you will see from the whistleblowers and the videos in their own mouth that these insurance companies are committing widespread fraud. Let's go on. Florida statute 626.9373, subsection three, in a suit arising under a residential or commercial property insurance policy, there is no right to attorney fees under this section. In the past, it used to say that there was basically a guaranteed right to attorney's fees. Let's give you, I'll give you an example. Let's say your adjuster comes out and says you have $30,000 worth of damages and the insurance company pays you $20,000. They know what they're doing and they know you have $30,000 of damages. That's what your adjuster came up with, but they only offer you $20,000, okay? In the past, you could sue them for that $10,000. Now you might have $50,000 in attorney's fees, but because they acted in bad faith, they would have to pay those attorney's fees if they, unless if they don't wanna just pay you the $10,000 and make it go away. Now under this new statute, you have no right to attorney's fees. Well, that means you would have to pay the 50,000 or 40,000 or $30,000 in attorney's fees to chase down that $10,000. Now, if you have a brain, that tells you you're not gonna do that, right? Nobody, nobody in their right mind would do that, which basically now empowers the insurance companies to make low level fraud, fraudulent uh, uh, claim payments widespread because they know nobody's gonna sue them because nobody can afford to sue them. That's what this new statute does. Let's go on and look at Florida statute 627.70131, subsection 3D. An insurer may use electronic methods to investigate the loss. Such electronic methods may include any method that provides the insurer with clear color pictures or video documenting the loss, including but not limited to electronic photographs or videos recording of the loss. And so what this means is that in the past, they used to have to perform a physical inspection of the property. This is where the whole adjusters came from. This is why we have um, uh, desk or uh, house in-house adjusters, field adjusters. You have uh, um, uh, private adjusters and public adjusters, right? This is where all these adjusters come from is because you have to physically inspect the property. What this new statute is essentially saying is that, no, somebody else in the company can simply just look at the photos and then readjust the value of the claim. And you'll see from the whistleblowers that this is going on a lot to the detriment of the public. Let's go on again. Florida statute 627.70131 subsection 3D continues. An insurer may void the insurance policy if the policyholder or any other person at the direction of the policyholder with intent to injure, defraud, or deceive any insurer commits insurance fraud by providing false, incomplete, or misleading information concerning any fact or thing material to a claim using electronic methods. So this is a law, new law that protects the insurance companies from you committing fraud, okay? But the problem is, is that it leaves too many loopholes. Like one is, is if you provide misleading information using electronic methods. So if you email the insurance company, okay, and you accidentally fill something out wrong on their electronic form, or you email them an accident, you know, you accidentally email them a wrong piece of information, or they just claim you did, that you misled them with your email, or your voicemail, or whatever you wanna call an electronic method, as long as they can claim that you misled them, they can deny your entire claim, and just say, well, you're, you're trying to defraud us. And the reality is, is that they know that they will lose in court, but the problem is, is that most of us won't have the, the financial means to take them to court because we can no longer get our attorney's fees. Let's go on. Uh, Florida Statute 627.70132, subsection two. A claim or reopened claim is barred unless notice of the claim was given to the insurer in accordance with the terms of the policy within one year and I, I left the cross out because it used to be two years after the date of the loss, a supplemental claim is barred unless a uh, notice of the supplemental claim was given to the insurer in accordance with the terms of the policy within 18 months, and it used to be three years. So all these other laws that I'm talking about now, they have actually reduced the time frame in which you have to file your claim. 
This is hyper, very, very problematic. When a major hurricane or a major flood or an earthquake or something comes through in our nation or in, you know any nation, but in America particularly, and you have tens of thousands of claims, there's not enough adjusters to go out there and really adjust all of these claims. There's not enough engineers and contractors and inspectors to go out there. I mean, if you look at when Hurricane Ian hit last year, my firm, my engineering firm, we still haven't gotten out to buildings to inspect them yet from hurricane damage. You know, and there are people that haven't even called us yet to come out and inspect their buildings because they keep waiting on the insurance or they're waiting on a contractor. And trust me, in a month or two months or three months or four months, they're going to realize, okay, these people aren't responding. I need to get an engineer out here to come look at my damage. Well, now if this process goes on for more than 18 months or a year, they don't have to pay you anything. Not, not anything at all. And finally, there's Florida Statute 627.70154, mandatory binding arbitration. This allows insurance companies to write policies that have a clause in them that requires mandatory binding arbitration and to give you a discount, which is gonna be like nothing, right? And so what I and all the attorneys are recommending to everybody is, is do not sign a policy that has this clause in it. What this clause means is that not only can you not sue them, but if you find some way to sue them and you have this clause in your statement, you have to go to binding arbitration. And in a lot of cases, binding arbitration is basically not going to take, it may not, because you're at the risk of who the arbitrator is and what the process is, okay? And, and oftentimes you may not be in a position to get the money you're owed and the arbitrator may just decide to split the pain down the middle. For example, you have uh, $200,000 of damages to your house. The insurance company wants to give you $50,000. Well, the, it's very unlikely that the arbitrator is going to award you $200,000 after being presented with the information. More than likely, they're gonna take the 50 and the 200 and they're gonna pick something somewhere in between and offer you you know, 125,000 or so uh, for, for your claim. So it's not in the favor of the public, this new statute. And, 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 and it's definitely not in the favor of the public to sign a homeowner's insurance policy that has one of these uh, clauses in them. So this raises the logical next question. Josh, you're pointing out these laws, you're pointing out this, this appearance of corruption, but none of this is proof that they're really gonna be doing anything bad. I really, I like those commercials that I see on TV. I like those insurance companies. They seem real friendly, I trust them. Okay, this is already going on. This is already happening. And we're gonna go through several videos right now and we're gonna watch and I'm gonna comment on this. These are videos that have been produced by a couple people. I'm gonna put the links down in the description so that you can watch the full videos. I never wanna be accused of just you know excerpting small pieces. I'm gonna give you the links to the full videos. Um, but essentially these are whistleblowers that have come forward and attorney Stephen Bush has recorded their a, a, a testimony, if you will, about what's going on. These are, so, so, so to give you some context, these are four independent adjusters. They work for the insurance companies and they submit their reports and their claims to the insurance companies to get paid out. The whistleblowers, we only have their first names. There's four of them. It's Mark, Sean, and Ben in the first video. And then there's a little snippet I'll show you of the second video uh, from Jordan. But again, I'll give you the links for both of those um, in the description. Let me get this straight, okay? Because I want to make sure that, that everybody's clear. So you went, you representing the insurance company, went to the policyholder's house. You viewed the damage yourself. Mm -hmm. You wrote a scope of the damages and estimated the damages. And then you send it in. And then they changed your scope to represent the insurance company's guidelines. And that scope that they represent, they left your name on it. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then when they left your name on it, the scope that they were presenting to the policyholder did not reflect the proper damages that were sustained from the storm. Is that correct? Correct. That not, correct. And not only that, there's a photo report where we send in, you know, where we show the damage on the photo report mm -hmm. to support what we wrote. So they're talking about these, these insurance companies' guidelines and the people that are testifying there are those independent adjusters. So they send them the reports, they send in the photos, they send in the estimate of damages to the insurance company, and then the desk adjuster modifies and rewrites their report in accordance with the company guidelines. But these guidelines aren't like editing techniques and like you know proper grammar. These guidelines are like guidelines that say things like, we don't pay for tile roofs anymore. 
<laughs> you know, we um, we only repair roofs. We do not re replace any roofs. I mean, these are guidelines that aren't based in like reality. They're just based solely on making the insurance companies uh, more money. Let's watch another one. In your opinion, are the insurance companies guidelines that the they're, they're telling you that they're changing the scopes to match? Are they reflective of what's actually damaged on, at the property? No. No, not, not at all. Not even close. All right, so that tells me then that policyholders are not getting what they're actually due oh, right. because of the guidelines. How do you feel about that? <laughs> not even close. Very well, that, that's one of the problems that you have here is the policyholder doesn't even know that they've got a problem. Right. They're, they're, they're going to go, well, uh, must be right. They sent me this nice form. It's all nice and printed out. Everything looks good. And this is what they paid. I, maybe I don't agree with it or I thought it should be more, but heck, you know, I'll take what I get. It, it, uh, it angers me because, in my opinion, I think that policyholders are not being treated as they ought to be treated. And that, I don't know about anybody else, but that's why I entered this business 20 years ago is to help people and for to see what I saw and to discover what I discovered, to me, appears to be an egregious display of, uh, of not doing what is right. Well, for the policyholder. For the policyholder, correct. Right. This egregious display of not doing what is right, we have a name for that. It's, it's called fraud, okay? The insurance company enters into a contract with you. They claim that if you get hit by a storm, we are going to act in good faith and pay for the damages caused by that storm. All you gotta pay is your part, which is your deductible, okay? When they grossly underpay and they modify these guys' reports and they leave their names on the reports to deceive the policyholder, you, you have this network of deception and lying and underpaying for profit, for gain, for the insurance companies. There, there's no other real word for that other than fraud. Do you think that, that these policies and procedures that they're now having you following in could be a direct result of why there's so much litigation? My opinion is absolutely correct. Yeah, 100%. So this goes right back to my last video on homeowners insurance being a scam. The, 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 the insurance industry has done an amazing job and their lobbyists and their massive PR firms have been talking to news stations, they've been talking to politicians and they've all but convinced the, the Florida people that they are victims of fraud from roofing contractors and, and, and mold remediating, remediation companies and things like that. They have, they have literally flipped the narrative. And one of the things that they complain about a lot is all of the lawsuits that they deal with, especially in Florida. Oh, the poor insurance companies are having to deal with all these lawsuits. And what they're saying here is, yeah, but the reason why you're getting sued is because you're underpaying all these policies. You're underpaying for damages. You're, 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 you're committing fraud against the policyholders. You get sued and then you cry about the lawsuits as if you're being bullied. It's a complete like gaslighting, honestly, uh, for what's going on here in this industry. So Mark, um, you and I were talking and you said that this has been going on now, uh, in your opinion, for some time because you went back and you looked and you discovered this was has been happening now for, for some time. Did you notice it in Irma or Hurricane over in Louisiana? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. So tell us about that. Um, well, so within that Xactimate system, okay, you can uh, set up things like macros as far as components of rooms and things like that to kind of help you uh, go through it a little bit quicker, things like that. Well, the company, now this was, you know, this was in Louisiana, this was last year, and I think Ben was uh, with me on this one too. Um, you know, typically these companies don't offer macros, okay? Uh, and it's funny because it, they're usually pretty good to have, but, um, you know, Ben and I have been to some conferences in different places and asked them, you know, hey, do y'all offer macros? And they're, no, 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 we don't. Well, the this particular company last year uh, offered some that were really well built and looked good. And, uh, and we were kind of surprised by that. But after about mm, three roof estimates into it and just doing this all the time, you know, we kind of looked at it and was like, this is way lower than, than what it should be, you know? 
And so I'm smart enough to dig into the macro to see what's going on with it. And when I did that, uh, it was off bad. The pricing was off. So I was like, hmm, let me, uh, let me just see if maybe they built this macro using a price list that was right before the storm. Maybe it's not an, an indicator of any type of market conditions for the time after the storm and blah, blah, blah. So I loaded in the price guide that was the month before the storm and it was still super, way less than that. And I was like, okay, so this is intentional. Um, at that point, I called the manager and said, hey man, uh, you know, the, the macros y'all are giving everybody if they're using them, which they probably are, they're uh, y'all are grossly underpaying these claims. But you know, each roof was five to six thousand dollars less. And he goes, "Oh no, no, man! You know, we're uh, we we caught that, and uh, as y'all are sending the estimates in, we're changing them to the right pricing." Well, <laughs> we were changing up the right pricing on our end once we figured it out. But when we sent them in, they they changed it back to the old price, the, the lower price. I was like, "Y'all got to be kidding me!" So to clarify, the macros that he's talking about are like little uh, pieces of, of, of computer programming that they can use to quickly estimate common things that they come across. Um, and it will pop out a number. So you, it, it, the idea would be like, instead of you having to do a bunch of research on pricing and um, the fact that you know the, the drywall has to be taped and mudded and painted and all these things, you would just say um, wall damage. And then the macro would figure out all the things that goes into a wall and it would pop out a number. You know, So you would only have to put in, okay, 100 feet of wall damage and then the macro would put out a number. And so what he's saying is, is that, you know, the, the, this particular insurance company wrote this piece of software, embedded incredibly low prices into it, hoping that the that the uh, um, independent adjusters who are using these little bits of software wouldn't notice that the pricing was way lower than if they had just taken the time to actually crunch the numbers themselves. And this gentleman's saying it, it, he caught it. And, 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 and then they, and then when he brought it to the attention of the insurance companies, they were like, oh yeah, no, we know we're fixing it, but they never did. They continued using the macro to defraud the policyholders. Let's keep going. So I had policyholders that called that, uh, that was like, look, my, my roof is not on here, you know? And, uh, so the roof was left completely, completely off. Completely off. Now this guy, but you had, but you had written for the roof. Yeah. And the, and the estimate that was submitted to the policyholder that you had written. Completely gone. Didn't even have it on there. But my name was still on there. But your name's on the estimate. Yeah. That's, and that's what's going on here. The independent adjuster creates a report. This report doesn't get printed. He doesn't print it and hand it to the homeowner. He submits the electronic version of this report to the insurance company. The insurance company is taking these the work that these independent adjusters are doing, deleting pictures, re-describing things, changing the estimate from $100,000 to $20,000 or whatever, and then leaving that adjuster's name on there and nobody else's name, no collaborator's name, nothing else, as if he or she wrote it that way. That is incredibly obvious fraud. Um, and this is sort of what, you know, I keep using the word fraud because that's what it is. It's real simple to point out and just say, this is fraud. Um, and I don't know what insurance companies these guys work for, but it's it's a handful, okay? Because they're independent. That's sort of the point. They work for an independent adjuster's company and they work for lots of insurance companies. So this is not just like one insurance company. This is a lot of insurance companies. But this is what's going on in the industry. Sean, do you have a specific example? I do. Uh, one of the claims that I worked in Fort Lauderdale had eight, foot, eight feet of storm surge in the house. Therefore, the only thing that I could really write as it relates to wind was the roof system. Uh, as Ben indicated, there were no missing shingles from the roof. The, however, the roof was three years old and clearly and obviously completely trashed with gouges, scrapes, gr all the you know, granular loss, etc. Therefore, I wrote an estimate to replace the roof. Uh, and I also added, uh, I, excuse me, Estimated for $500 for food spoilage, which is the policy limit. The firm or reviewer completely removed the roof from my estimate entirely. Didn't estimate to didn't change it to repair. They just said $500 is all that's needed. However, they did not change my narrative that they supposedly sent to the insurance company. And on my, in my narrative, it still says 
the you know, that it needs to be replaced and explains the amount of damage on the roof. All right. Now, in both Ben, you and Sean, in both of those examples, they never contacted you before they, they changed that, correct? Not at all. Correct. All right. No. Did, they, no. did, they, did they contact you after they changed it and told you that they changed it? No. All right. And are they leaving your name on these estimates that they're changing? Yes. And they're representing, they're representing that this was your scope and what you found. Yep. Correct. And that's not true. Yeah. Yep. Same not thing with all. you, Mark. 100. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this goes back to what I just talked about, right? It's just sh more evidence, more of the whistleblowers exposing what's going on and how the insurance companies are doing it to us, the policyholders. Let's continue watching. Company that I was working for and the carrier were taking my estimate, changing the scope of work, and you know, then turning in that new collaborated estimate um, into the into the insured to you know give them a check based off of that new that new uh, uh, estimate that that they wrote. Um, all right, so they didn't collaborate with you at all. They did not. <clears throat> Sorry, no, sir. No, sir. They did so, not. They did not. <clears throat> so they completely changed your estimate that you wrote for and then submitted it on. Did they leave your name on the scope? They did. They did. They left their my name on the scope, you know, with my license number. Um, the collaborator did not leave, you know, their name or or insert their name as a collaborator, if you will, right? <clears throat> Um, they just, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, they would change the, the estimate, the general loss report and the photo report. They would, you know, change all these things that would, you know, in the, uh, on the first part, on the first half, the first end of the storm, you know, would have, in my opinion, properly indemnified the, 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 the policy owners. How did they change your photo report? They would take that photo report delete photos or, you know, just change the verbiage of, of the photos, the description in the photos. Okay. So were the photos they were deleting photos that showed damage? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Okay. Whether, and then it you was, whether it was physical damage that you could see <laughs> with the photo or in, in the photo, or if it was a, a, you know, a photo of a, of a moisture meter, you know, reading the, the moisture content inside of a wall or on a on a baseboard, on a piece of crown molding, on, you know, bamboo hardwood flooring. Um, those are the kinds of things that they would delete. Things that show damage, that Absolutely. proved there was damage. Okay. You can, you can almost hear the tension is like palpable, right, in his voice. He continues like choking and clearing his throat and stuff. I mean, you got to understand these whistleblowers are coming out. They're pretty much never going to get hired in this industry again. I think I think these people should be commended for what they're doing, and I think it's it's while it's sometimes frustrating when you're listening to the video, you're like, oh, why is he clearing his throat? Why is he coughing so much? I mean, you got to understand these people are are experiencing complete career changes right now, um, so this is sort of a big deal that they're coming forward and that they're exposing the insurance company fraud. Um, I just wish more was being done about it from uh, from legislators or from. Uh, you, you know, from the attorney's office or something like that, but uh, but you can almost hear the feel the tension that this young man is uh, is feeling right now. And he goes on to say, and this is our last clip, uh, some some more interesting things. Yes, sir. So you know, the 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 use of the drone and the and the aiding of my inspection was was primarily for safety. <clears throat> um, yeah, I was concerned about my safety because of the. The, the, these high wind speeds that this per, storm produced, you know, and the, and the major granule loss that I saw on these shingle roofs, I, you know, I didn't want to take the chance and fall. And so, you know, I had a, a drone that was, you know, aiding in my exterior inspect, inspection, uh, primarily on the roof. And, um, you know, these drone photos showed all sorts of damage. You know, the, the major granule loss, the wind uplift, Missing shingles, you know, missing right. missing underlayment, missing deck. So when you when you took those drone photos that showed this damage, did you turn those in as part of your report? I did. I did. All right. And, and then what happened? And <clears throat> once I turned it in, and I started turning in, you know, a, a, a significant amount of claims, I had the storm manager call me, and he straight up told me that 
they cannot deny claims if we are using a drone for drone, I mean, a, a drone for, for exterior inspection. And, and I asked, I just asked a simple question. I said, why would we want to deny claims in a storm like this? And the gentleman hung up on me. So, so in your opinion, with what he told you, was he saying that, that it was their intent all along to deny the claim and that you were providing evidence that the claim should be paid and they didn't want you doing that? That is the way that I took it. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And how did you feel about that, Jordan? I felt real, real bad. I felt real bad about that. I didn't, you know, I don't want to be a part of something that is, that is like that. I, you know, I mean, the, the, the whole reason I got into this industry was to, to help people. I mean, we, as insurance adjusters, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure the policyholder, you know, whether it's commercial, uh, residential, to make sure that that policy owner gets a proper amount of money to fix their storm as if the damage never happened. And do you feel like that, that your hands were tied? I feel like my hands were tied and my legs were cut off and they told me to swim back to shore. Very powerful words from one of the four whistleblowers that we heard from today. Um, really just putting it out there. I mean, this is a guy who, and you heard the other, some of the other whistleblowers say the same thing, that they got into this industry to help people. And they feel like the, the, the industry that they're a part of, the insurance companies that they're partnered with are defrauding and hurting people. So it's the opposite. This is why they mention, I got into this to help people because what they're implying is, is that the insurance companies by doing these deceptive practices and committing this fraud are hurting people. And this isn't what they're about. This isn't what they wanna do. The depressing conclusion to this video <laughs> is, you know, what can we do about this? What, you, you listen to this, you hear this, you see that lawmakers are literally spewing the same narrative that the insurance companies are spewing, that it's all lies, that they're committing fraud, and that the laws just keep getting written more and more in favor of the big industry and the big corporations. Um, the federal government requires you to get insurance if you have a mortgage. I talked to my bank and I said, um, for flood insurance, because you only have to insure for $250,000 in flood, not that that's some small amount of money. But I said, let's just pretend I have $250,000 in the bank, which I don't, but let's just pretend I do. Um, could I put that money into an escrow and just insure my own building? And they said, no. And I said, well, why not? That's, that's the only, that's the amount I have to pay for a flood policy is $250,000 coverage. And they said, because the government <laughs> won't allow us to write you a bank loan and have that loan federally insured if you don't have flood insurance. The entire system is built between this, this, this connection between the insurance industry, big business, and the government colluding. Um, and so we asked the question, you know, what can we do about this? I mean, yeah, you can write to your congressman, you can write to your senators, you, that's all important. But the reality is, is that the reason why, you know, I created this YouTube channel was to talk about engineering, talk about building, and talk about related things that relate to construction, like homeowners insurance and things like that. But the reason why the channel is called Building Integrity is because um, obviously I see, and like many of you that are fans and subscribers to the channel, we see a lack of integrity in the public and, 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 and in the world, really. And so the question is, is how do you cure this problem? Well, the, the only real answer is, is that you have to raise a generation of people with integrity. And so that's, I guess, my parting thought to everybody is, one, do you conduct yourself with integrity? Integrity is, is doing the right thing even when nobody else would know that you did the wrong thing. Do you conduct yourself in that way? And are you participating in the raising of, an, of the next generation of people of integrity? And those are the questions I'll leave you with today. I'll look at your comments down below. Thanks.